Hello, Level C. Uh, I saw some of you at the end of last term on a Zoom meeting seminar, um, but this may be the first time that some of you have met me. I will introduce myself quickly. I'm Dr. Paul Johnston. You call me Paul. Um, I am a lecturer in creative writing and I'm also a novelist. I've published 20 novels and various short stories, some poetry, as well as academic articles. So I cover the entire spectrum, I like to think. Okay, um, today we're doing uh, the sixth part of narrative. You've done the other five with Emma. Uh, I'm taking over now, as you know. So let's get started. Well, we will get started when I can get my slideshow to work. There we go. So, I like to start lectures with what I call a glimpse of the sublime. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the word sublime. Sublime is something that takes us out of ourselves and as the backdrop to my um, presentation suggests into the realms of space, into the realms of the infinite, into the transcendental realms where ordinary life disappears and we think about um, the eternal major issues of life and death and God and no God and infinity and so on. That sounds um, very uh, wishful thinking perhaps. In reality, it just means that I give you some quotes or I give you, in this case, some pictures to think about and they're usually related, well, they're always related to the theme. Okay, what you see here in the, uh, the first uh, picture is, well, think about it. Um, it's clearly a writer. He's got an extremely fine moustache. I had an extremely fine moustache, but someone nicked it. Um, he's not writing. He's thinking, cogitating, wondering what to write next. You can see that his pen is he's looking not at the paper but into the distance perhaps somewhere in the, into the sublime so so he's trying to get a hold of ideas or possibly themes i would suggest in case you're interested that is rudyard kipling author of among many other things the jungle book he's often seen as the poet of the british empire but actually there's much more to him particularly in his short stories which are extremely fine Moving swiftly onwards, notice the change from male to female. Um, this is someone who's possibly being a bit more practical about their ideas. Again, she's looking upwards to the sublime. See how carefully this has worked out. Um, but she's also uh, done uh, a lot of work on her blackboard. I know it's a bit old fashioned, how I long for the days of blackboards. Um, and chalk everywhere, chalk dust. Um, and she's doing something like a mind map or, or some kind of structured thinking exercise. Notice the speech bubble. She's got around a certain idea, who knows what it is. But anyway, she's trying to rationalize her ideas. She's trying to bring them together. She's trying to construct something out of them, which of course is what we do when we're thinking about stories, novels, whatever else. So another way of um, thinking about ideas is to look at them in a more practical way and, and, and try and work out how we um, come up with them. Still involves thinking, but it also involves um, putting it down in, in, not in writing, but in some form of uh, structuring device. So, where do you get your ideas? I'm taking the Mickey slightly here because it's the classic question that uh, people ask authors. I've been asked it in the bookshop events and in festival events and so on. I think every author has. Um, some people are, are, are slightly snide about it and say from the idea shop. Um, I've got a shop here which is not exactly an idea shop, but it is a very famous bookshop, Shakespeare and Company, uh, oddly enough in Paris, um, where James Joyce and various other people used to congregate. Um, and of course, it's not entirely uh, taking the mickey because inside that 
a particular shop uh, are many ideas uh, in enclosed between the covers of many books. So it's not an entirely flippant question, where do you get your ideas? Although actually it's one that authors really struggle to answer and tend to be rather, um, uh, rather loose in the way they answer, should we say. Well, where do you get your ideas? As I say, it's not an entirely stupid question. Uh, and the answer is quite complicated and will not necessarily be the same for every person. In my case, uh, because I have had rather a lot of life experience, and because I'm only 23, but I've had an amazing life, um, life experience mainly involves people, although obviously uh, it involves lots of other things, going to the moon or whatever that is behind me, possibly, uh, certainly travel, whatever else, anyway. But life experience is mainly about people. It, it's mainly about people that we, write in our books uh, and therefore uh, experience of reading books. Uh, I, I haven't counted how many books I've read because um, I'm not very good at arithmetic. So, except when it comes to marking. Um, obviously that's fiction and non-fiction. Films, I'm a great lover of the cinema. Plays, land and seascapes. I have a particular interest in landscape and seascape and how it's portrayed in fiction. Animals, which are fascinating because they seem to be like us a bit, but, but also entirely unlike us. Uh, the natural world in general, as big as blue whales and as small as gnats. I have to say I haven't written about gnats very often, or about whales, now I come to think of it, but whales are intrinsically more interesting than gnats, I think. There's a challenge, right? A story from the point of view of a gnat. Mm -hmm. um, and many other sometimes strange, objects, creatures, thoughts, feelings. Feelings obviously are important too in creative writing. Uh, and I could make that list, and I'm sure you could do the same thing for yourself much longer um, if, if there was world enough and time. Okay. Uh, you may have seen originally that the title of this lecture was the other way around, theme and idea. Um, I've changed the order because I want to look at idea first for reasons which will become fairly obvious, I think. Uh, I mean, it's important and useful, I feel, to distinguish between idea and theme. So uh, always in uh, academic work, we need to define our terms. Um, and a basic idea, uh, definition of idea is a thought or suggestion as to a possible course of action. So sayeth the Oxford Dictionary. Um, so this is something that's, um, really quite significant in writing. Um, it's something that, that uh, will play a significant part in how your story or your creative nonfiction progresses. I've got an example here, um, which I definitely have used in my writing. Um, oh, I know, I'll have the protagonist meet the policeman in the pub. Well, yeah, well, uh, protagonists of crime novels uh, tend to be fairly keen on the beer and so do policemen, oddly enough. On the other hand, a theme, uh, so saith the Oxford Dictionary, is an idea that recurs in or pervades a work of art or literature. So there is a difference there that I think is fairly clear. Theme is a big idea. It may even be a collection of smaller ideas that come together to form a large theme. Uh, a one that dominates uh, other ideas um, and, and uh, basically runs through an entire work. Uh, a good example of that would be Hamlet, um, Shakespeare, Shakespeare's probably most famous play, certainly his most um, performed play. The theme of Hamlet is revenge. Well, that's a position I'm taking. You might say the theme of Hamlet is, I don't know, uh, incestuous love, I'm sure. Freudian scholars have probably um, gone for that one. So can you see the difference between idea and theme? Idea is something very simple in your story. You were writing a story where you think, what am I going to do next? The, the look into the sublime that Kipling was doing in the first picture, um, or, or that the lady in the second picture was looking up into the sky for. It might just be something very basic. Um, and I'll go make a tea, a cup of tea now. 
it's not very interesting, but it may, may be integral to your plot if um, when you go into the kitchen, you find a burglar there. I'm really talking off the top of my head now, which as you can see is totally covered in very long hair. Um, but this is what an idea is. It can be something extremely small, whereas the theme is much more significant and probably covers and definitely covers the entire work. Okay. So let's look at idea uh, ideas in more detail. I'm going to have to move my icon here so I can see the PowerPoint. Hang on a second. There we go. Um, this is a more practical issue. How, how to use idea as an enabling device. So uh, people obviously have ideas all the time. We have ideas one kind or another. Literally, not, not when I'm doing a lecture like now, but you listening to it may well be having ideas. And I'd suggest that creative artists, not just writers, but creative artists of all kinds, probably have more ideas um, than most people. I don't know. Do you agree with that? Think about it. So what do we do with these ideas? Well, in the first instance, I would suggest that you write them down. I don't do this quite as much as I used to when I was starting. When I was starting, I was extremely panic stricken about losing ideas, particularly if I came up with them in the middle of the night um, in dreams or, or whatever else. And I would have a notebook nearby all the time um, in my back pocket. And now, of course, people do it on the telephone, so fine. But um, I haven't worked out that aspect of my phone yet because I, I'm a Luddite, as you may realize. Technology, technology is not my favorite thing. But anyway, um, and I still write down notes, um, but I don't do so as much as possible because I, I have lear learned from experience that if an idea is any good, you won't forget it. Um, if it's being kind of dismissed by maybe even your subconscious, then it'll probably disappear. So don't get too panic stricken about that. But I still recommend that you have a notebook or that you use your phone to take down uh, notes of ideas and other things as well. Yeah. Uh, so, especially at the beginning of your writing career. Of course, it doesn't matter if your ideas turn out not to be used. I've, I've recently found uh, in a, another house that I used to live in uh, a couple of notebooks that were literally jam packed full of ideas, none of which I ever used. Um, but that doesn't mean the writing down wasn't a good part of the process of becoming a writer. Uh, and of course, I'm very happy uh, as a Scotsman to um, sell any of these ideas to you, who, um, uh, if you're interested. That was a joke, by the way. Um, can you start writing a piece without an idea? Well, I don't know. You, you may disagree with me. You, you may like to look at the blank page or the blank screen and just see what comes out when you start writing. But I would suggest that you have to have some kind of idea of what's going on. Uh, who the who the protagonist is, what's the point of view, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, even if you haven't planned in any great detail, you you will start from an idea and then move on to other ideas, and they may well originate in your subconscious, which often is a good thing. And you'll find that one idea propagates another one and another one and another one and so on. I'm sure you've already had that experience. Okay, idea is premise. So uh, premise is, as the Oxford Dictionary again says, I presume you're familiar with that Latin word, which is abbreviated at the end of the quotation, ibid, ibidem, it means it comes from the same place. So it can't come from the same website, of the Oxford Dictionary that I used earlier. Premise is an, asset, an assertion, an assertion, I can't even pronounce it or a proposition which forms the basis for a work or a theory. So uh, when it says an assertion, it's something more concrete than an airy-fairy idea, okay? Um, and this has more practical use for us uh, in the development um, and, and the making more deep of the pieces that we write. Because in creative writing, a premise is not an abstract proposition, but something that you can link to the emotions and the senses. So a feeling, an image, a color, a beautiful dark blue that I have behind me. Um, a sound, a smell, a taste, a touch. You remember all the sessions you did with Eleanor earlier in the year about the senses. Um, so for instance, the emotional or sensual premise of your piece could be love, linked to a specific place perhaps, or hate, 
love and hate often go together. Um, desire to succeed and get rich. Can I move my bar? Yes, I can. Um, uh, to get more than a father's gold watch. Yeah, if your father, father got awarded a gold watch by his place of work, um, you, you might well, or your character might well feel that this was uh, rather uh, disdainful on behalf of the employers and much more, more significant would be to have a, a better job in which you have some control of your own destiny. These are just examples. This is now jammed, so I shall have to go to, hold on, next slide. Okay, um, so how does character in your writing fiction and maybe creative nonfiction as well, uh, and sometimes poetry too, um, link up with premises and ideas. Um, I've given the example here of Sherlock Holmes. You might not like him, but you can't deny that he's an extremely well-known fictional character, one of the most well-known. I suppose Harry Potter is probably coming out of the outside lane now, but um, uh, there are a few fictional characters um, who seem to have taken on a, a kind of real life um, whether they look like um, Benedict Cumberbatch in the BBC series, which I absolutely hate, or whether they, they look like Daniel Radcliffe or whatever else. Um, so these characters are larger than life, but it's, it's not necessary. And actually, it's probably not a good idea at all to have your protagonist being larger than life, expect it, except in certain kinds of writing. Uh, we'll talk about that in other sessions. But generally your protagonists uh, are just ordinary people, but with something not ord ordinary, either hidden in their character, in their personality, or in terms of the events that are about to occur around them. But if you're writing a realistic story about a family, it, it's not necessary to have someone who's a cocaine taking that's a reference to Sherlock Holmes, if you're not familiar with his habits. Um, but people still need to have a distinguishing characteristic. Your protagonist will have more than one distinguishing characteristic. And that doesn't mean they have to have a long Roman nose or hair down to their backside or whatever else. It's something that has to link up uh, emotionally to specific objects. So in the case of Sherlock Holmes, he's very attached to his violin and also to his chemistry set, which drives poor old Dr. Watson around the bend because of the stench she produces. Um, something that might be significant is a memento from uh, relatives who may have passed, um, something like a grandfather's watch. Uh, I do actually have my grandfather's gold watch. Um, I'm not telling you where it is. Um, and it is actually very precious to me. I have my father's watch as well, actually, but his isn't gold. My family has come down in the world. Um, not at all. <laughs> my grandfather was a primary school headmaster. He still got a gold watch. I don't know if he was given it by the local education authority. That's an interesting point. Anyway, these premises and ideas are often very memorable. I don't know if you've read Great Expectations or seen the films or the TV series. Um, Miss Havisham, um, who's uh, someone who was uh, left at the altar by her uh, rather dodgy bridegroom decades later is still wearing her rather tatty wedding dress. Uh, a more familiar example might be in the Lord of the Rings. I haven't even bothered to say Lord of the Rings because I'm expecting you know this, but actually actually, the movie seemed to have disappeared from some, some people's minds already. Um, anyway, the hero Aragorn wears um, his uh, beloved orphan woman's uh, brooch, not all the time, because sometimes it falls off. Why are these uh, individual objects so memorable? And they bear in mind that they started their existence as ideas in the author's mind, because they inspire the characters to action and to emotion and to, and to feeling. Okay. Right. Does an idea have to be original? Well, uh, you may have read in, in creative writing self-help books that you do need to find something original to make your story or novel stick out from the rest. Hmm. Uh, there are different ways of looking at that. Um, I've actually got a quotation here from the Old Testament. 
Um, history merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new, which actually, from a philosophical point of view, is quite interesting, but we're not doing philosophy, so let's leave that. Uh, I don't know what you feel about that. I, it just doesn't, it isn't right, I don't think. Uh, I must I rather flippantly say afterwards, whoever wrote Ecclesiastes didn't know about the internet. Well, of course he didn't know about the internet. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming it was a he, could well have been a she, but uh, actually, no, probably not in the Jewish tradition, but whatever. Um, things change in the world that we live in. And obviously, 2,500 years ago, uh, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have medicine that we have. They didn't have uh, cars. They didn't have all sorts of things that blight our lives, frankly. Anyway, uh, even if it was the case, uh, there wouldn't be any, if it was the case, it, there wouldn't be any point in writing. And of course, many of us, that's why there's so many of you uh, in uh, this class, uh, want to write. Why would we want to write if there's nothing new to write about? It's just not the case. And in a way, every individual will bring something uh, different in terms of their voice and their experience and so on. However, more practically, we can achieve originality by use of language and how we use the social context of our writing. So uh, we can, even if we're writing something realistic, we can have a certain voice, um, a, a certain amusing take or sardonic take on, on what's going on that will be, uh, to some extent at least, original. Yeah, there will have been people who've been more amusing and more sardonic. I'm not suggesting that we have to become Billy Connolly or um, Aristophanes or Jonathan Swift or whatever, but we can make our own combination of, of, of different aspects of writing and be original. Obviously, if we write science fiction, it's pretty easy because uh, then you're creating a completely new world, which automatically will be um, original. That's a bit of a kind of sort of easy way out to think in terms of this question but anyway um originality is a problematic issue uh, and i don't think it's um uh, so important as many people would, would think uh, because using language in an interesting way it is in itself original okay it's possible that the writer of ecclesiastes meant that people don't change um although yeah, because, well, I, I think that that is a hint in there because he, talk, he, he or she talks about history. Uh, history obviously is made up of the actions and, and emotions of people. Um, and he's suggesting that people don't, he or she suggesting that people don't change. Well, that's not my experience of life. Um, they may not change radically, but the, the way their lives develop, develop makes them change in ways that, that they might not be willing to do and so on but change is something that happens in life and of course it happens in our fiction as well and in any case we know ways to write original originally how about giving your protagonist an original blend of qualities that's certainly what conan Doyle did with sherlock holmes um it, to, to an extreme you don't have to be to have someone as eccentric as that but uh, there's no question that a combination of, of, of an interesting personality with an unusual, uh, com combined with, a, a, say, an inappropriate background, an unusual background, uh, can produce something very interesting. Um, the example I, I came up with was, because I go to Greece a lot, um, have you ever come across a, a, a fantastic bazooki player from Birkenhead? Maybe you have. I doubt it. Um, I'm sure there is. There are a couple, but uh, it, it, was, that, it would still be an, an original way of positing your protagonist, wouldn't it? Uh, and then, in the more broad sense of, uh, of theme, which we'll come on to in more detail later on, um, you could have something that, that is much more overarching and much more significant in your story, um, along the lines of "It doesn't rain in Manchester." Yet, ha ha, every time I've ever been to Manchester, I've been changed. But with climate change, it's entirely possible in the real world, let alone in, the fi in, a, in a fictional world, that Manchester uh, might become like Alicante. Maybe it has already, I don't know. Anyway, onwards. 
Um, how does idea link and premise, how do idea and premise link up with plot? Well, that's fairly easy to answer because uh, as you've seen from uh, Emma's lectures, um, plot develops from characters primarily. Um, so as I said, your protagonist should be original in some blend of psychology or family or schooling or friends or profession or whatever else. Um, but this all is linked to how your plot develops because the plot basically is how the protagonist acts, reacts, decides what to do, then acts again and so on. And you show this by using specific objects and feelings because the protagonist obviously acts and reacts because of some emotional response, okay? Uh, an example I'm giving here is Barry Hines's novel, A Kestrel for a Knave, which unfortunately I don't think many people read it anymore. It was published in 1968, but it was made into a very famous um, British movie called Kez. Um, if you're not familiar with that, I would highly recommend both the book and the film. Um, you have a tough Yorkshire lad who, rather against character, uh, lovingly, re lovingly raises a kestrel from, um, from um, Chick. Uh, it's a very uh, clearly an original idea in terms of uh, plot, um, but it's also emotionally very powerful work. Just move my icon slightly. Um, so idea and premise linking with setting. Bear in mind that set it, setting includes time as, as well as place, yeah? Um, so what might be distinctly unoriginal in a cliched setting uh, can be transformed when the setting has changed. So instead of London, uh, put your character in a much smaller country town, or instead of a country town, put them in a village, or have them on their own, isolated on a mountain. Yeah, uh, changes of location, uh, and these are all ideas, of course. Changes of location, um, and you can have, have you can have your character start. I mean, this actually happens in the Sherlock Holmes stories a lot. Um, they start off in London and they get called out to somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And of course, in the Victorian time, trains went everywhere. So they leap on a train and arrive in, in some high, highly uh, isolated rural location um, and uh, solve a crime there. So that's already happened. I mean, well, well over 100 years ago, changing location in order to show your characters acting in different ways, right? Um, if you're looking at a character that's more uh, sort of permanently defined by setting, um, think about various professions, pilots. I'm afraid I'm of an age where when I see a female pilot, I still notice it. I, I don't disapprove of it in the slightest. In many ways, it's a bit like female drivers, who I think are much more responsible than males, um, especially young ones. Um, I, it's just interesting to me to see a female pilot because there never were any when I was young. Um, Ditto sailors, there are, as you'll probably have seen in documentaries, there are plenty of, of women uh, sailors in, in the Royal Navy. Um, not so many, I think, in the Merchant Navy, which my father used to work in, but I'm sure there are some. Um, farm workers and so on, often women are involved in farm work. Um, these are long-term jobs often, and therefore, to some extent, uh, they will define the character, they will be linked to desires on the character's parts to do these jobs, and therefore, that, that's an integral part of, of who they are. Um, and on a, on a more uh, short-term basis, if you like, I mean, obviously setting, um, <laughs> in the case of pilots, it's a very small setting, it's a, a, a tiny cockpit, although they're going all over the world, it's quite an interesting combination of, of locations, isn't it? Um, it? But in terms of plot and setting, uh, you can have, uh, a specific location that may only last for a few days. Recently, there's been a movie about Dunkirk. I think that was, a, uh, it was an anniversary as well, wasn't it? Um, the soldiers at Dunkirk were only on the beach for a few days. Some of them, unfortunately, were only on it for a few hours because they got killed. Um, and then, of course, there was a flotilla of small ships that came and rescued them. Uh, and if you've seen Christopher Nolan's movie, you'll see that uh, it's very moving in, in the way it shows the innate courage that people can find in them. And on the other hand, that there are some characters who find that they don't have any courage. So character and plot uh, in terms of actions uh, uh, can be defined by setting. All right, and we can, how do we link ideas and premises to 
genre. You're familiar with the term genre, I presume. Genre is, I, I used to do events with an author called John Conley, and we used to um, have a bet that the first person who used, used the word genre had to give the other person a quid, um, simply because genre isn't really an English word, it's a loan word, it's clearly a French word, and we kind of almost have to pronounce it in a French way. Genre, I don't know how it would be pronounced in the, the more British way. Genre. <laughs> but anyway, we don't seem to have a word in, in English that covers it in the same way. And a genre is a, a subdivision of, uh, of of writing. So you talk about the crime genre or the science fiction genre or the romance genre or whatever else. Um, so we're looking at different kinds of writing here. Um, Christopher Brookmeyer, who's a very fine Scottish crime novelist, um, a few years ago, he set um, a country house murder uh, a la Agatha Christie on board a spaceship, which really annoyed me, actually, because it was such a good idea, and I wished I had it, and I was jealous of them. This is what authors are like, by the way. Very backbiting. And then we go to the pub and everyone loves each other. Um, an overused subgenre is love in wartime. I'm sure you've seen many movies or read romances or whatever else uh, about this. It seems to, they seem to stick together like, I don't know, bread and jam. Um, and, and become cliched. Um, and I suspect love in the time of COVID is going to be all over the place in the next year or two, uh, particularly because of the difficulties of um, carrying out love in the time of COVID, unless you break the law. Interesting idea. Um, but you could have something more original, love during sittings of parliament, which are televised, by the way, mm, on second thoughts. No. Um, and instead of changing genre, you can you can just take elements or what we call in literary criticism tropes. You may be familiar with the word. I don't know if M.O. Donner has used it from other genres. So um, you can have a spaceship landing in Liverpool one in a, a story that was up until then completely realistic. Anything that surprises readers readers is good. Um, or more seriously, in a novel about growing up, they're called Buildings Roman here. Another loan, loan word, that, this one from genre, uh, from German. German genre? Blah, 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 it's very confusing. Um, uh, the, the novel of growing up is called The Buildings Roman. We don't seem to have it possibly because the novel of growing up so, sounds ridiculous. Um, in such a book, suddenly a gun is found in a play school. Hmm. I'm not talking about a plastic one or a water pistol. So these are elements taken from one genre and moved into another. And most important, perhaps, idea and premise and how they link to language. And you'll remember, I'm sure, the uh, what in past years have been when I've done them have been notorious, not necessarily in a good way, um, sessions on building blocks of language. Lang language, of course, is all important in our writing um, because that's the way that readers engage and experience, engage with and experience our work, yeah? So an idea or a premise here is that you use different kinds of writing in either throughout the piece, you could write it in, I don't know, um, Scouse dialect, um, if you want to restrict your readership only to uh, Merseyside, but that may be okay in the first instance, uh, but you can change styles either throughout the piece or in different parts of the piece, that might be a different character, uh, a character who speaks in a different way to the others. Um, tones, the tone of voice may suddenly go from being ironic to when someone falls in love to suddenly going, oh, I don't know, lovey-dovey or whatever, however you want to call it. The register, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that word yet, register is, is the different kinds of languages that are used in different locations locations or settings in terms of work. So we would talk about pilots having a certain register in which they use technical words. Doctors famously have um, certain registers. Novelists probably do as well, but we won't go into that. Um, and sometimes you could use dialects, although be careful about too much dialect, because obviously people who don't speak that dialect are gonna potentially get turned off. Let me just move this. Um, you can always, enrich your language by working hard to use striking vocabulary, striking unusual metaphors and similes that are different to anything you've seen before. This is a challenge, really. Uh, you'll remember the session that uh, Emma, I think, would have done on 
for the creative in creative writing. This is the source of your creativity, what you can make out of uh, language constructions that might have been cliches in the past. Can you make them more original? Okay. Yeah, that's what I get it. Moving that means that I can't now move my uh, slides on. Um, okay, so how do we move from idea, a smaller thing, to theme, a more uh, overarching thing? So your basic idea or premise, then supplemented by lots of other ideas and premises, should build consistently, well, through character. Well, con consistently, you might argue, about, because it might well be that because of what happens in your story, the character needs to do a sort of handbrake turn and, and behave and feel in totally different ways. So maybe question mark against consistently. Um, through character, plot, setting and language. So all of this will combine and potentially produce a theme that develops out of the entire work, whether it's a story, even a piece of flash fiction uh, or a novel at the other uh, end in terms of length. Now, when you start off writing, as I said before, you need an idea. Um, you don't need a theme. Uh, sometimes it's very hard to think of themes. I'm, I'm seeing Kipling looking into the, the far distance as he was in that uh, picture at the beginning of the session. Um, it maybe was looking at the theme. Well, in which case he was probably on a fool's errand because often themes are kind of subconscious almost and they develop as, uh, as you write the work, work and may not be apparent to you or the reader until the end. Um, more important in the writing process is to keep, on the way, uh, an, uh, keep, a, keep an eye on the way that your ideas develop and bounce off each other and so on. Um, and of course, it is possible that what you think is your theme won't be shared by the readers uh, who might well think, as I said with Hamlet, um, they might think the book is about something completely different. Uh, um, readers are free to produce whatever feelings they have about the text, and there's nothing much that we can do, do as authors. The more we try to make them think in a certain way, the less likely they are to do that. And it's not really something to worry about anyway. Once you've written the book and maybe identified a theme, possibly as you go through in the second half of the book um, and, and at the end when you're revising it and so on you, you might well realize what the theme is um, but if other pe people come up with other ones it doesn't matter. Well let's move on to theme now, um, the more overarching thing and the thing about theme is that it, it seems automatically to relate to morality. Uh, I'm, I'm taking for granted that you understand what morality is we can't live without some kind of set of morals. And we talk more in the, in the third year about um, morality and ethics, but uh, you, you're welcome to uh, investigate it further at this stage if you want, but it's not really necessary. What's more important is that writing that affects most people, affects in the sense of making them feel uh, the way that you might want them to in your writing, uh, often validates readers' values. So if you look at the bestseller list, there's, there's always exceptions to this rule. So you're welcome to come back at me, but uh, uh, generally speaking, this is the case, I think. Most bestsellers validate readers' values. Um, and particularly when it comes down to the basics of morality and ethics, which are good and evil and right and wrong. So if you look at books like The Lord of the Rings and, and the Harry Potter novels, um, they very much, have set up good and evil and the conflict between the two and ultimately good with sacrifices and with losses will prevail. Uh, in the top 10 bestseller list, you, you don't ha tend to have novels uh, where the opposite happens, where evil prevails. And there are such novels. There are many crime novels actually where you know, the criminal either gets away uh, or the private eye, what we call noir fiction, uh, the private eye at the end is just exhausted, has lost the woman he'd fallen in love with. Uh, he has understood, and it could be she as well, of course, nowadays there's plenty of uh, female PIs, um, has realized that the world is 
profoundly corrupt and that no matter what he or she does it will remain so and it's a very downbeat ending so that again is a question of genre or subgenre but generally speaking books like that uh, i don't know but i don't think raymond chandler's novels which are now viewed as being among the best crime novels ever written. And by the way, I don't only talk about crime novels. I have mentioned Hamlet already, yeah? but it is my area of expertise. Um, Raymond Chandler is viewed as being one of the greatest uh, crime novelists. I very much doubt his novels would have been, I don't think they had a top 10 then, to be honest, but I doubt they would have been top 10 bestsellers because they are um, pretty much of a downer at the end, although they're beautifully written, and I highly recommend them. Um, on the other hand, uh, moral tales that are too simple tend to be boring, yeah, tedious. So fables, uh, I read Aesop's fables when I was a kid, as, as maybe you did too, I don't know uh, if they're still peddled now. And, um, I really disliked them even when I was young because it was obvious that there was a, there was a moral, there was, a, there was something you were supposed to take from the tale. So for instance, the tortoise and the hare, um, the moral there being that um, slow and steady wins the race. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's just a bit dull, isn't it? Um, let's not write that kind of thing if we can avoid it. Um, how do we make our writing more thematically challenged? How do we make our challenging? How do we make our themes gripping to readers? Well, I think the only way to really do that is to challenge ourselves. Uh, and move outside of our comfort zone. I don't, I don't know how you feel about your first year of creative writing, but I'd like to hope that you've been moved out of your comfort zone very frequently um, and challenged about what you write and what you feel and what you think and so on. Um, yep, here we go again. Sorry about this. Okay. So, um, page two of aspects of theme. When you have conflicting ideals uh, or values, notice ideals, ideals are, uh, here rather than ideas, so ideals, what people uh, set up as, as their sort of um, uh, philosophy of life and how they live life, uh, linked with their values. Uh, if you find, if you have a character has completely different um, moral uh, worldview, then you will have conflict. And of course, conflict is one of the roots of uh, interesting fiction, interesting writing. And we'll do a, a whole session on that next year. Here's an example. Uh, a corrupt policeman might be a good father. Doesn't seem very likely, but, but there's no intrinsic reason why that wouldn't be the case. Um, or a female prime minister may remain above the backstabbing of ordinary politics, which is, of course, mainly undertaken by males because there are more males in parliament. I suppose I'm thinking a bit here about um, the prime minister of New Zealand, uh, Jacinda Ardern, who does seem to uh, be a bit different in terms of uh, how she uh, presents herself as a, as a uh, national leader and on the world stage. Bravo, women. Um, I wish all leaders were women, frankly, but unless their name starts with th and ends in er. Uh. See if you can work that one out. Um, note that, according to Donald Maas, who's an agent as well as a, write, uh, a writer of, um, uh, if you like, self help uh, books, and this is quite a good one actually, writing the breakout novel. Uh, he says, travel to a familiar moral destination, but by an unfamiliar route. That's clever i agree with that so uh, instead of having the boring uh, sort of fable i was mentioning before um you uh, you could complicate it in that particular let's take the case of the tortoise and the hare you could complicate it by having the tortoise being devious and and cunning um which to some extent he kind of is but um i'm assuming that he uh, he's cunning and devious. No, all right, let's leave the sex issue, but the gender issue uh, alone for a bit. Um, you could have him uh, being uh, a, not a very likable character um, who sneakily wins the race by outthinking um, the hair, which, which, which is in effect what happens, but it's not really presented in that way. 
Um, so finding unusual, that's another way to be original, finding unusual ways of getting to a familiar end, i.e. good triumphs over evil, um, the lovers get back together, um, uh, uh, but through a very unusual way, um, down an unusual route, uh, it's an interesting way to, to develop your plot and also to potentially make your theme more interesting. Let's have a look in a bit more detail about creative writing morals, morality in general, because it is important and it is obviously morality is linked to theme and to some extent to ideas as well. You know, an individual action can be immoral. So morality applies across all of our uh, ideas of idea and uh, across the whole spectrum of ideas and theme. So to achieve maximum effect on your readers, every piece you write should affect them emotionally and intellectually. Note the order of words here. I, um, the general feeling, and I agree with this in fiction writing at least, uh, and certainly I, I would say in, in poetry too, is that you should affect them emotionally first and intellectually second. In as much as those things can be separated, obviously you want some kind of organic whole, but um, emotions are, are what you should be working with first of all. Um, you could have a protagonist, for instance, with a really bad temper, uh, and maybe one of the issues in the story is that by the end he doesn't have a bad thing to some extent because he un understands other people better. Um, that would be one way of developing a, a theme. Because morality, uh, interestingly, is linked both to our emotions and our thinking. If you think of something that you, you find abhorrent, uh, or at least that you dislike intensely when you see it. Uh, for instance, uh, litter, maybe abhorrent is too strong a word, but if you see people dropping, um, you know, sweet wrappers or cigarette cartons or whatever else, just on the pavement without a care in the world, um, your immediate reaction is gonna be emotional, isn't it? It's just wrong, that makes me angry, yeah? You might even take your life in your hands and run after the person and say, I think you dropped this, which I wouldn't really recommend to be honest, depending on who it is. Um, and then afterwards, we might rationalize it by saying, well, you know, littering is intrinsically a bad idea because it makes a mess and potentially it's dangerous if you leave banana skins on the road, on the pavements, and et cetera, et cetera. But it's emotional power that hits us first of all. Excuse me. Um, so we need to think about moral positions that underpin our own lives because they will influence obviously the lives of our characters uh, and I think it's a good idea to consider what we think about uh, issues of delinquent behavior, crime, corruption in government, incompetence in government, etc, etc. Yeah. Um, because these moral positions do affect our lives and obviously will potentially affect the lives of our characters. More on morality. You're keeping up with this. I'm sure you are. It's not hugely difficult. Here are some questions to ask yourself before, during and after writing any piece. You know, so this is an ongoing uh, issue of uh, something to have at least in the back of your mind when you're writing and perhaps more in the front of your mind when you're revising. Your story, poem, piece of creative nonfiction, whatever it is, are you in the business of validating widely held moral values? Well, that's up to you to answer in each individual case. Um, I've written a lot of satirical novels, and obviously, sat the point of satire is to knock um, standard moral values on the head and push them over. Um, problem with satire is it doesn't tend to suggest alternative ways of life it's primarily destructive rather than constructive um it d depends a lot on the moral values and bear in mind of course also that moral, moral values almost immediately for humans being humans uh, involve potentially at least involve hypocrisy okay so there's nothing wrong with validating widely held moral values 
But on the other hand, there's nothing wrong with having a go at some of the people who hold, hold these values if they're being hypocritical, okay? And you need to ask yourselves, if you want to validate these values, why is that? Because they are the same as your values? Because you believe these values are essential to maintain civil society? Yeah, these are all good reasons. If you don't approve of that, of widely, widely held moral val values and the hypocrisy they potentially entail, then why is that? Is that an aspect of your character? Is that an aspect of your character that you're particularly proud of? Um, is it something you think is beneficial to your readers? It may well be, um, but it's something you need to think about. It may be that you're, you're more keen on immoral values in your fiction um, because you lead very moral lives, yeah? Or maybe you're keen on immoral values because you live immoral lives. I don't know. Certainly there have, have been writers um, who at least have been perceived by critics. But if, you, if you think of D.H. Lawrence and the famous Lady Chatterley's lover, um, he was widely seen as attacking uh, the moral values of the time, uh, which uh, he may have had that intent, I, I, I don't know, but um, he was trying to be honest about sexual relationships. Yeah, he may have failed, but it was, uh, I think, a valiant attempt, whatever you think about the novel or the numerous films. Um, Anyway, whether it doesn't really ultimately matter that much whether you go for the moral or the immoral line in your writing, um, it, 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 your theme needs to be informed by the moral values of your character, which I suggest would be linked to your own moral values, even if you're revolting against those. Okay, this is a subject for further discussion and, we, and you're welcome to do so either in seminar or, or, or in the forum. So just to summarize then on theme, uh, in order to produce a theme that works, whether you know clearly what it is or whether your reader um, struggles to understand what the theme is, because, because frankly, if you go to readers groups or writers groups and say, right, what, after you've read a book, what do you think was the theme of that no novel? Often people won't even have thought about it. They've just enjoyed the novel or they've read the novel with interest because of the characters, because of the plot, because of whatever else. The theme may not be that important, but the point is that, as I suggested earlier, is not really something that writers have to worry about too much, at least, at least during the writing process, but you need to be impassioned. You need to be passionate. And I think we have mentioned this in the past about every piece of your writing, because passion in the sense, and I'm not talking about sexual passion necessarily, or it depends on the kind of writing you do, but passion in terms of what you're doing with your characters and your ideas and so on in your writing and your theme ultimately, although that may not be clear, um, it, it will result in clear moral positions. So, uh, you know, Sherlock Holmes, for instance, for all his taking of drugs, which only happens when he's bored and he hasn't got a case, and, and his general eccentric behaviour, he is very clear in terms of his morality. He's good against evil. He's pro the government of the day. He protects it often in, in cases. Um, and uh, although he seems to be a bit of an eccentric and almost anarchic human being uh, uh, as an individual, in terms of his morality, he's pretty um, standard and, and, and pretty typical of the time in which he wrote. And actually, obviously, because he's still so popular with readers, uh, his morality uh, is, is relevant to modern readers as well. Um, something that often, often happens, in, and this goes back to what we were talking about, um, change earlier on, your protagonist will often develop in moral terms uh, throughout the book. And this is quite common in fiction. Someone starts off as being either fairly nondescript in terms of their moral positions and, and, their, and their character in general. And ultimately become something much more potentially admirable. Um, I don't know if, don't know if you I don't know if you're familiar with um, Charles Dickens's *A Tale of Two Cities*, which is about the French Revolution. Um, there is a, a sort of waster character, a lawyer called Sidney Carton, um, who, by the end, without any spoiler alert, because it is a book worth reading. All Dickens is worth reading. Well, maybe not *Sketches by Boz*, and I've never been a lover of the *Pickwick Papers*, but, but everything else by Dickens is fantastic. 
um, uh, Carton, by the end of uh, Tale of Two Cities, becomes a hero uh, and in a convincing way, which is a good trick to pull off if you can. Um, so the protagonist may experience moral development. I'm going into TV here now because we're talking about themes and so it doesn't matter whether, the, whether they're written down in novel form or, or on the television or on films or whatever else. Um, the opposite of Sidney Carton could be someone like Tommy Shelby in Peaky, Peaky Blinders, who certainly by the end of the last series seemed to be more or less uh, at the end of his tether, uh, ha having been a war hero. Uh, he's, he's realized that uh, you know, his life is, isn't really worth living. And it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next series. It's important with theme not to impose it. We go back to the, the tortoise and the hare which has a very strong didactic sort of teaching purpose. Um, don't impose your theme if you work it out in advance um, on your writing. Um, I'm sure you have this experience of, of reading fiction particularly, and it applies to creative nonfiction as well, and I think to poetry too. You know, if someone's hammering away at a certain point all the time, you know, that you, you must behave in a certain way, or my character does this, the, this, and the suggestion is that you should behave in this way as well. It becomes didactic, as I said, it becomes more like a lesson, maybe from a preacher rather than a teacher. But anyway, the same kind of thing, a preacher rather than a teacher. There you go. Um, and generally speaking, we don't like that as readers. Uh, hold on, what have I written here? Yeah, weave it, weave your theme subtly into the text, or at least via your various ideas, a, a theme will develop. And it shouldn't be made too obvious to the reader at least until the end. Okay, I have to do this again, not that, this, yeah. Um, so I was we're just coming to the end, I, I would suggest that this isn't something you should do all the time. It's not a, um, an exercise I'm asking you to, to complete or anything, but, uh, and I think you'll, have, you'll have, this is a kind of a summing up almost of what you've done throughout both the sessions on narrative and all of the things that you've done up until now. Um, Part of developing as a creative writer is becoming more aware of yourself in terms of your emotions and your thought processes. You, that is automatically really happens and it's best to be aware of it, uh, not in order to control it, but just so that you can use it more effectively in your writing, yeah? Uh, try to work out your moral positions on life's significant issues. Uh, friendship, family, work, power, relations, justice and injustice, love, mortality, and so on. Um, again, uh, some of you are, are, are young, most of you are young, um, I am you. Um, I can remember it vaguely through a haze of something. Um, but you, gradually you will work out these things. I don't think it's necessary to write them down on a bit of paper and sort of have a list of, you know, these are my moral positions and pin it to your chest uh, that would be extreme because of as I, as I said earlier on people change and your moral positions may well change uh, in fact they almost undoubtedly will uh, as you go through life and that that will be replicated in, in your characters they as they go to your stories yeah but having some idea of what your moral positions are it enables you then to apply these moral positions to your characters or perhaps the opposite, to apply the opposite moral positions and see how that works, okay? Uh, so yeah, as I suggested at the end, this is an ongoing process. And as I said, you may well find that you change your positions, which is not at all a bad thing, um, unless you decide to become a criminal, of course. No comment. All right, I'm just gonna run quickly through the seminar exercises, but you might wanna think about these before the seminar. Five lines on how you get your ideas. No idea shop. Thank you. And then we'll talk about that. Uh, second exercise, five lines on the themes that interest you most and why. You might need more than five lines actually, but anyway, um, it's just a question of, uh, uh, of producing something we can discuss. And which senses and emotions could they engage? Uh, these are, these are theme, themes in the more general way you might like to relate them back to individual idea, ideas, but the important thing, important thing, the most important thing in creative writing is senses and emotions first. 
thinking processes second. Uh, let me just fiddle around with this. Uh, applying idea and theme to your own work. So I'm asking you here to remember the plot that you constructed with Emma um, and featuring a protagonist that you created in the character session the week before. What would you say was the idea? I uh, noticed ideas to this is something small. Yeah, they've got the narrative structure moving. What is the incident, the inciting incident, as some people call it, that gets your story moving? Yeah, that's a small idea, um, maybe a conflict that gets things moving. And what other ideas did you think of when you constructed these plots and characters? And here we go again. From a widest perspective, what was the theme? of the narrative that you came up with. I know you not, haven't necessarily written an entire story, but try and extrapolate from what you thought about in terms of what this is about. This is about good conquering evil, or this is about evil conquering good, or whatever. Okay. Hang on. And here is a tutorial exercise for uh, Wednesday the 28th. Consider the differences between idea and theme, and then write 10 lines on their practical uses. How will they give your characters and story greater depth? We've talked about that quite a lot already, and obviously we will talk about it more in seminars, so you'll have some pretty clear ideas by the tutorial, I think. And if you favor one between idea and theme, which is totally fine, you might feel happier working with smaller ideas on a day-to-day -day basis rather than working out a th theme which, as I said, isn't not isn't essential at all and may well change is during the writing process. Um, if you favor one of those, explain why. And if you find both useful, also explain why. There is no escape. And that, my dear level C, is that. I will see you in seminar. Bye.